So could you tell? Whose side was God on? Who was God rooting for? Jeremiah? Hananiah? Nationalism, subservience, heavy taxes? It's hard to tell on that one, isn't it? Jeremiah was not a uh, popular prophet. Basically, it shows that God wanted Judah to bow down to the power of Babylon. But that's not the sermon for today. We'll save that for a different day. So, on to John. Can you arrive at power through subjugation? Can you arrive at subjugation through power? The political battle between the Pharisees and the man born blind, that's the story we're about to read, the man born blind. The political battle between these two groups attempts to answer this question, the same question that Jeremiah and Hananiah were sort of battling back and forth. So now it's subjugation and power. And although the passage that I'm about to read is much shorter than the passage that Julie just read, it too requires some back story. So Jesus and his disciples are walking around Jerusalem, and after seeing a man who is blind, a man whom they all know was born blind, the disciples asked Jesus a very famous question. Jesus, was this man, is he born blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? That's a bad choice between two bad choices. So who sinned, this man or his parents? And as many of us probably know, Jesus says, well, hey, like neither. You know, it's not, it's not this or that. Neither sinned. So immediately after saying that, Jesus then spits on the ground, makes a muddy paste, rubs it on the man's eyes, and then tells the man to go wash off in the pool of Siloam. He does so, and he instantly sees a miracle. Well, this miracle, it sets off a political battle between the powerful and the powerless. A battle between the powerful leaders of a subjugated minority. Remember, the Jews are not in any shape or form powerful. They are under the subjugation of Rome, pretty much like everyone else in the known world at this time. And the powerless within that subjugated minority. So it's Jew against Jew within a hierarchy of power. It's kind of like those Russian dolls. There's always this never-ending hierarchy. So we pick up the story after the Pharisees have interrogated the man and the man's parents, but they are unsatisfied with the answers. So they determine that they need to investigate the man again. So, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. That, by the way, is a phrase that kind of means, um, do you promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? It kind of sets the tone for the man to be on trial. Okay, give glory to God. We know that this man, meaning Jesus, is a sinner. 
We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, the man who was born blind, who is now sight, who now has sight, he answered, I do not know whether this Jesus man is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And, and he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen to me. Why do you want to hear it again? Oh, do you want to become his disciple? Then, upon hearing that, they reviled him. And they said, we know that God has spoken to Moses, and, you, and we are disciples of Moses. You, however, are his disciple. But as for this man, this man Jesus, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he, this Jesus man, comes from, and yet he opened my eyes now we all know as Jews that God does not, listen, does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships God and obeys God's will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Some people complain that churches, historical churches within the main line of denominations are not relevant. But our larger in membership, more popular, evangelical, and theologically conservative cousins somehow appear more relevant, somehow attract much larger crowds I guess perhaps it is because at times some of those churches are able to have a more unifying political opinion amongst the congregation. For many mainline traditional churches like this, that's not the case. We often represent the political spectrum. Sometimes those evangelical churches are able to discuss politically relevant, contemporary events in a more pointed manner than some of us. A while ago, um, I was talking with someone, a couple months ago, I was talking with someone after church in the fellowship hall, and um, they, they made some comment, and, and my answer was that I always strive. I think every preacher must strive to deliver a sermon that is relevant, either culturally relevant, politically relevant, emotionally relevant. Whatever is going on in the life and times of a congregation, the sermon needs to attempt to address that thing or the couple of things, whatever it is. In fact, I think I told this person that I, I think church should be as relevant to the day as the New York Times. Or if the New York Times is not your news source, um, Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or the Fargo Forum or the Star Tribune. If we're not coming to church to learn something about our life today, there's no point in coming to church. Now, there's a lot of things we need to learn in church. How God loves us, why God loves us, how we address sin, 
how God works to change our life. So there's a ton of things. But relevancy, it must always be relevant. So, so today, the sermon topic today is, um, is going to be um, something relevant. Can you guess what that might be? It's not emotionally relevant, so I apologize if today is a day that you really needed something emotional. Perhaps we can find that in the rest of the service. But in the sermon today, it's going to be politically relevant. What do you think the topic is? Someone? Shout it out loudly. Not the choir. I can always hear the choir. The choir is usually on top of things. Shout it out. Political relevance. What do you think I'm talking about today? Thank you very much. The Supreme Court, nomination hearings, Brett Kavanaugh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. Ah, so here we go. A, a disclaimer first, um, there are a number of levels within the discussions that have been going on all week on TV and in Washington, D.C. and across the country. A sexual assault may have occurred. And we need to be very sensitive to that. It's an endemic problem and has been for many years. The courage to speak up on this issue is, is something I cannot understand or fathom. So with sensitivity, we will attempt to go into this subject. So fair or unfair, at issue in the scripture passages that I read and that Julie read, and at issue in the Kavanaugh Blasey Ford hearings, is the subject of power and the balance of power. A balance of power between a majority and a minority. Jeremiah was outside of the circle of power. He did not live in the palace. He was not the king's prophet. That was Hananiah. The man who was born blind was a beggar. The Pharisees are in power. Granted, they're a minority, but they're in power within their minority. And they actually have the power to throw people out of the synagogue. Now, the, the synagogue is not the temple. There's only one temple. But many cities had synagogues. And the synagogue, if you were a Jew, was kind of where your people were, your social contacts, your support network. It was all within the synagogue. And at this time in history, um, at, at the time that... John is writing, so not the time of the story, the time that John was writing. The Pharisees, who were, who were in political Jewish power, were, had this new rule that they could throw someone out of the synagogue if they believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And that's what John's writing about right here. And to be thrown out of the synagogue was to be thrown out of any cultural support amongst your friends and family. Something similar, fair or unfair. Again, I, we're not discussing issues of fairness. We are discussing issues of reality. For the first time in his life, Judge Kavanaugh is being forced to stand as a representative of everything in which he has ever grown up and known. A white, male, wealthy, private school, Ivy League education. He represents, for the first time in his life, his entire class of type of person.
it's an uncomfortable place because what is on trial in Washington, D.C. right now is the, is, is the rising woman being able to say to the face of public power, this occurred to me and I must be heard. For the first time in his life, Judge Kavanaugh is standing in for his entire political class. That's unfair. It's also reality. As someone who is a minority, as an openly gay man, I can tell you firsthand what it means to stand in, not as myself, to be judged not as me, but often to be judged as the first gay man that someone has, ha has met, at least openly gay man that someone has met. When I was in college, I was the first openly gay man that many of my college students had ever met, and I knew what that meant. It meant I represent every gay person they will meet after me. I have to be good. I better present a good face. So that if they become the parent in the future of a gay or lesbian child, they, may, they, they might think back 20 years to that person they no longer remember, but who sort of began to shift their mind about what it means. If you are a person of color and you live in Fargo and you're walking down Broadway, you probably know, I don't, but you probably know what it's like to be judged not on your actions. It's like the children's sermon. It is completely unfair for a third grader to be judged by the actions of their fifth grade sibling even before the teacher has ever met them. If you're a person of color walking down Broadway, you are walking in the middle of history. A white person, not every white person, but a white person is judging you based on the historical actions, the historical interactions they've ever had with a person of color. And then, you represent for that person any interaction they might have in the future with a person of color. What Blasey Ford is doing is upsetting that dynamic where white men of wealth and educational privilege are simply able to say, I did not do it, and you believe me because I am a white male of privilege. I went to Yale. I coached girls basketball. What else did he say? It was a defense of everything he is and every good thing he's ever done. But that's not what was on trial. At least that's not what was supposed to be on trial. What was supposed to be on trial was a an attempt to uncover the facts between something that happened many years ago. The reason we are riveted, that we were riveted, is because under the surface is a shift in the balance of power between what always has been and who always possesses that power and the ability to pull the strings of government 
a shift towards a more equitable balance of power. Hananiah possessed the king's power. Jeremiah suffered because of it. The man born blind had no power until Jesus Christ gave it to him. And the Pharisees saw that shift. Fair or unfair, as this nation moves forward in the Supreme Court nomination process, it's not only a discussion between Blasey Ford and Kavanaugh. It's a representation of a shift in the equity of power. As Christians, we know the source of power comes from God and only God. Allow God this week to be your constant conversational companion as you watch what happens on the TV screen and the newspapers. And always be aware of where the, bow, the power balance lies as you interact with this society in which we all live. To God alone be the glory. Amen.